Thanks for joining me today. In last week's lesson, I asked the question, how many times do you think the word Christian is used in the Bible? And I shared with you that it was only three different times. And uh, I also pointed out the first time. I, I indicated that in Acts chapter 11, I believe it is, uh, somewhere around verse 26, it says, and they were called Christians first at Antioch. The second time was in Acts chapter 26, I believe, when uh, King Agrippa said to Paul, he said, uh, do you think that you can persuade me to become a Christian? And uh, it is felt that in those first two cases, that term Christian was meant to be a derogatory term. That uh, whenever they said they were called Christians first at Antioch, uh, it was by the outsiders, those who were not Christians, and they meant it in a derogatory fashion. They were not giving them a compliment whenever they said, hey, look at those Christians. But uh, years later, in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, Peter uh, shares everything in a different light now. He says in verse 16, he said, However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear his name. Well, what name? Christ. Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Messiah is what the name Christ means. Jesus the Anointed One. Uh, Christ was not his name. Jesus was his name. Christ was his title, describing what he came here to do as God the Son. And so as God the Son, he wants us to be followers of his divine glory. And, and so today, we are going to look at those who shepherd the flocks. I'm only going to deal with four short verses in my Bible study with you today. And I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I don't like to teach about myself. And it, it's a little bit difficult for me to share this particular passage of Scripture because I so want to make sure that I am correct and, and yet, sometimes um, I don't want to come off whenever I'm teaching about the way somebody ought to be a shepherd. Uh, I don't want to come off as sounding holier than thou or sounding as if I uh, know it all. Uh, as many of you know by now, I have served in five churches as their pastor. And I will say, uh, while I was young, in the first church that I pastored, and then also in the second, I did not necessarily invite scrutiny or criticism or um, uh, people to share a different opinion uh, other than my own. Well, I, I shouldn't be blamed too harshly for those first two churches. I accepted those positions whenever I was 21 and then 24. I was still very, very young, not only in the ministry, but even young in the faith. But really, beginning with my third church and all the way until now, I have tried from time to time to um, uh, have church leadership help give me a proper uh, evaluation. I have uh, tried to reach out to the other elders, the deacons uh, of the congregations where I served and, and, and just say, hey, am I on the right page here? And there have been uh, a few times in my 41-year career that uh, another leader has brought something up as a result of either an opposition or scrutiny, but for the most part, I can uh, I can comfortably say with all confidence that uh, I really have had blessed relationships 
with every single one of my deacons or the uh, ministers, lay ministers, that also served in my congregation. And, 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 and that's a blessing to me. I, I don't take that lightly. I don't take that for granted. I have served alongside of some mighty good men. And, and there are a few of those guys that have sat alongside of me in support of me that I would put up against anyone uh, as, uh, as to their character and their integrity. Uh, so today I want to talk about those who shepherd the flock. You know, I, I really believe that even though this passage is talking about pastors, I do believe that there is a direct correlation uh, with that term deacon. Uh, matter of fact, um, there are different denominations today that kind of have a uh, different focus for the word deacon. Uh, some really believe that uh, the deacons in some denominations although they carry some spiritual leadership and even some spiritual clout, uh, much of their responsibilities is to oversee the facilities of the church and the uh, over the outer workings of the church, pretty much like in, in Mount Zion's congregation our trustees do. But, uh, <clears throat> but the uh, uh, term deacon among General Baptists uh, sometimes the word elder is also used to describe them. So it should be somebody who is rich in faith, somebody who is not a new believer. But today specifically, we're going to talk more about the pastor or even the individuals like the role that Peter played. But uh, notice what it says beginning in 1 Peter chapter 5. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder. Now notice this. Peter belonged to the church at Jerusalem, and yet his um, writings were far more reaching than just the local church there at Jerusalem. And uh, he considered himself an elder in the complete church, not just to Jerusalem. He said, to the elders among you. So to the leaders and the pastors of the various churches, he said, I am writing this to you and I am appealing unto you as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Then he says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away want to remind you the crown of glory being spoken of there is uh, not a kingly crown. Uh, in the Greek New Testament, uh, there are two different words that translate into our English word crown. And uh, the word diadema, that is the kingly word. That is the word describing uh, royalty. And so the shepherds here are told that they will receive a crown of glory. It's not a kingly crown. The other word to describe a crown uh, in the uh, New Testament in the Greek is the word stephanos. And uh, it's the word that we get uh, uh, the idea of a victor's crown or a trophy. Uh, whenever someone was a hero at war, uh, they would receive a Stephanos crown back in those days, a victor's crown. They help lead the army into battle, and they help preserve the victory. They were the hero of the moment, and so it's a victor's crown. 
Also, the term crown uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians and Paul's letter, especially in chapter 9, uh, the word crown is used, and it's also a Stephanos crown, but it's relating to somebody who wins at the Olympic Games. And so, uh, so we see the parallel here. So uh, the crown that we receive is for winning the war or winning the race. And, and, and so I think that that's one of the things that, that we need to understand in this passage of Scripture. Another thing that I want to point out before we take a step back and look at it in a bit more detail, uh, it says in verse 2, be shepherds, under the, uh, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you want willing, because you are willing. So not because it's your duty, but because you want to. Because it's your privilege to do that. You recognize the call of God in your life, and it is your privilege to serve in that regard. And so, uh, so I have really, really been blessed uh, in the ministry in that regard. Uh, the people that I have been able to work for, uh, for the most part, in every single church of those five churches that I pastored, now, I, I got to tell you, I'll just be honest. Two of those churches had their own share of struggles and tension for me. Now, I'll back up and say at this point, one of those churches that uh, provided uh, a, a lot of struggle for me was also the church that up to this point in time where I had received the most rewards. And, and that's the reason why I stayed at Centerpoint for 27 years. That um, I went there to help work with people through their struggles and mine together. And, and some of it was tumultuous, some of it was torturous, uh, but the rewards that came with it made it worth the lengthy pastorate. Uh, I've got to share with you. The uh, very first church I pastored, it was, uh, I, I was there almost three years to the day, would not, if there are those of you listening at Mount Olive right now and, and, and watching this, uh, I, I want to tell you that, that that church was such a blessing that the only reason I left that church was because uh, it was a bivocational church and I wanted to be able to to every single day of the week to be a pastor and to just really be deeply engrossed in the work of the Lord. And that was why I, uh, I left the Mount Olive Church. But as a church congregation, you talk about a group of people that uh, were, were so appreciative and so easy to, to, to pastor. God has blessed me in so many ways. Uh, I can look back and I can pinpoint my greatest blessings at Mount Olive, at uh, uh, there in Warwick County, Indiana, at uh, Bethany Church outside of Campbell in Malden, Missouri, uh, at South Poplar Bluff Church in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, and uh, the Centerpoint Church at Hendersonville, and now the Mount Zion Church. I can already see, even at Mount Zion, uh, where those blessings are coming from and all of that, what it does in my heart and in my life, it makes being a pastor a privilege to serve God. Uh, there was a friend of mine and I, uh, we were ministering together at church camp. He was a pastor too. And uh, there was a deacon that uh, actually was put in our dormitory to look over uh, uh, some of the student campers that were there. And as the week rolled on, uh, uh, we, we noticed Dan was asking us all kinds of questions. And, uh, and then we came back a couple of weeks later and served again. Dan was a deacon. He was also a principal at a school. And, um, and so, uh, so whenever he came back that second time, he shared with my friend and I, he said, you guys need to know something. He said, I have accepted the call to preach. And, and then he said, one of the reasons, he said, God's been working on me for months, even years. 
He said, but I have been hesitant to accept that calling. And, uh, and then he told my friend and I, he said, the reason it was easy for me to accept the calling now, he said, I saw two individuals, two pastors. It was my friend and myself. And he said, you guys make it look fun. And, and uh, I, I got to give credit to the churches that I've pastored. But being a pastor has been a pure delight for me. Uh, there have been times that it has been hard work. There have been times that whenever I've uh, I cried with somebody over a dilemma, it's been excruciating. But it has been nothing but a privilege. Nothing but a delight. Well, let's fast forward ahead to where we are today, to where we are now. We are going through some periods of struggle. Our country, our world, uh, it, it not only continues to be sin-filled, but there is so much suffering going on. And to the group of people that Peter wrote this letter to, they were experiencing Christian persecution. And so times of persecution demand that God's people have adequate spiritual leadership. And, and so uh, it, it's very, very important that uh, God's leaders be faithful and true to that cause and to the position to which they have been called. Uh, I also want to share with you in chapter 4, verse 17, I uh, shared a verse with you last week that says, Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. And, and what that is meaning is that, well, for example, uh, the times that I have put myself uh, under a microscope for my uh, leaders to evaluate me, uh, the times that I have willingly done that, it's because I realize that if I'm stepping outside of God's plan, that judgment begins at the house of the Lord. And as Christians, we are giving one another the permission to judge each other according to the Word of God. Am I living up to what the Word of God says? And, uh, and if I am, and if I'm reacting in my ministry to what is pleasing in the Word of God, then I need to be encouraged that that's exactly what I'm doing. But if I am not, I also need to be uh, uh, corrected. And the scripture even says that, that that correction needs to begin gently because quite honestly, there are a lot of people that would handle scrutiny uh, from other believers if it was handled appropriately and gently, understanding that we are just trying to improve uh, uh, in our own human way what God has perfectly set up for us according to his word. So here, Peter wants the leaders of the church to encourage one another to continue to work faithfully. So I uh, want to remind you through the Old Testament, every once in a while you will read the word elder. Another time you will read the word bishop. Um, most of the time it refers to the same office. Uh, the word bishop literally means overseer. And so the word elder refers to the maturity of the position or the maturity of the office. And the word bishop refers to the responsibility of the office. So let me say that again. It's really important. Whenever you read the word elder in the scripture, it refers to the maturity of the office or the maturity of the officer, the person holding that position. Is that individual spiritually mature so that they can effectively execute that office? The title bishop, it refers to the responsibility of that office. Uh, the word pastor means shepherd. And, and again, it also refers to this one same office. So Peter was concerned that the leadership of the local churches, that we be at our best. And whenever uh, trials come to those congregations, they're going to look to elders or to look to their leaders for encouragement and, and, and for direction. So, what qualities make for a successful leader? 
Now, now again, uh, I, I have difficulty sharing part of, uh, 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 of this type of thinking because I don't want to appear to put myself on a high horse in any way. But the first key characteristic or the first three, uh, key quality of a successful leader is this. They must have a vital personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, Peter uh, does a good job just referring to himself as just another one of the many elders. And uh, I, I like, I, perhaps it was uh, uh, Peter's experience after, uh, after Christ welcomed him back, you know, after he denied Christ and Christ welcomed him back, uh, uh, maybe that was the humility and the humbleness that Peter needed. But, but I see in his uh, uh, writings in First and Second Peter, I see a confidence because he walked with Jesus. But I see a humility because he knew that he was a human being just trying to serve uh, a great God. And so uh, Peter does point out that he had faithfully witnessed the sufferings of Jesus Christ firsthand and, and, and foremost. Uh, again, in verse 1, it talks about that glory that will be revealed. And, and it reminds us of some of Peter's experiences with Christ. Uh, matter of fact, one that comes to mind is the experience that Peter had with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, you'll remember that at the very end of Palm Sunday, that Peter and James and John went all the way up on the mountain of transfiguration with Jesus, and it was there that God shone his glory upon his son, and Jesus was transfigured before them. He radiated God's glory. It was just uh, additional evidence that he was God in the flesh. And it so motivated Peter that uh, he looked at Jesus and he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. And Peter wanted to build uh, some tabernacles. And uh, Elijah and Moses just happened to be there too. So Peter wanted to build a tabernacle for Jesus and for Elijah and for Moses. He wanted them to have a, uh, a time of worship. He wanted them to have a camp meeting experience. And so Peter knew what the glory of God looked like because he had seen it radiated through Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration. And it also uh, reminds me of another experience of Peter. Uh, whenever in John chapter 20, after his resurrection, a week after his resurrection, when Jesus appeared before the 11 disciples and he confronted Thomas and uh, he said, Thomas, you know, hey, you said you wouldn't believe unless. He said, well, Thomas, behold the nail prints in my hand. He said, matter of fact, take your finger, put your finger in those nail prints and take your hand and put it into my side where the spear w went. And he said, uh, Thomas, don't be faithless. Believe. And at that moment, uh, I think it's in verse 20 of chapter 20, or verse 27, I guess it is. But uh, it, Thomas looked at Jesus and he said, Oh, my Lord and my God. So um, there are other passages of Scripture that uh, tie in, I believe, with, uh, uh, with being a shepherd of a church. I'm really particular with John chapter 10, whenever Jesus is talking about the sheepfold and how the uh, a shepherd uh, will get the sheep in the fold to do everything that he can to protect them, and uh, how he'll go in and out. He'll do whatever is necessary to keep uh, someone or something from robbing the sheep. And, and so, uh, so I, I find that very, very interesting. Um, uh, there was one of my church members back in Tennessee one time that asked me and uh, uh, said, whenever you can't sleep, what do you do? And I said, well, I do what a lot of you do. I said, I count sheep. And then I just started in mentioning some of my church members by name. 
And so uh, sometimes at night, whenever I can't sleep, that is exactly what I do. Uh, there, uh, the Lord will bring different ones of my church members to my name, and, or to my mind rather, and at that time I, I, I will count them. I'll count their prayer needs. I'll count their prayer requests. And, and, and I will remember uh, uh, them in that moment. Now, in verse number three, it warns shepherds, it warns pastors of not lording themselves over others. Um, you know, one of the guides that has helped me uh, in my many, many years, I believe, to keep from uh, uh, lording myself over others, uh, and, and that was, uh, I, I came up with a concept that I believed was true. And, uh, and it was one of my deacons that helped me with this, uh, with this concept. Uh, and, uh, and anyway, I said something to him. Uh, we went to visit a lady uh, that was having surgery. Her mom was from a different denomination, a, a denomination to where the pastors were only the speakers. They, and, and they were the elders led the church. And, uh, and so, uh, so anyway, um, my deacon asked me for direction. And, uh, and so, uh, so I said something and it offended the lady because, you know, her, um, uh, her minister did not speak to the elders like that. And so she said, aren't you an elder? And, and she was just blunt and, and, and really, honestly, a, a somewhat offensive to the two of us. But, uh, but she said, uh, she said, do you let him talk to you like that? And my friend said, like what? You know, and, and she said something to the effect, like he's the one in charge. And uh, my friend, uh, he began sharing with her. He said, well, you don't understand the way we operate. He said, he is my pastor. And he said, so he is over me. And he said, but I am his deacon. And he said, uh, collectively, our deacons are over our pastor. And so, uh, so it was some insight that I have always lived with. You know, I believed it up to that point in time, but I had no idea that I had been articulating the concept. And I had no idea that my friend believed that so strongly. And, and it was really, really a blessing to me. And whenever I keep that into perspective, it enables me to go before the group of deacons who are, are responsible for, for uh, uh, helping maintain my relationship with the church congregation. And so it's easier for me to say, well, you know, guys, am I missing anything? You know, guys, what am I doing? Have I missed a step here? Have I done this? And so uh, depending upon the way that they approach me on that, if they come back and say, you know what, Mike, we think you've missed a step here. Uh, it enables me to humbly say, well, I think you're right. And, and maybe that's one of the reasons that with the numerous, numerous, numerous number of deacons that I've had in the five churches that I have pastored, uh, uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why I have always had a very strong working relationship uh, with my deacon board. I want to remind you, Peter had a vital and growing relationship with Jesus Christ. But whenever he said, don't lord over others, maybe the reason Peter wrote that the way that he did was his original readers, they lived in a class system. There was the upper class and they were the lower class. And the upper class could lord themselves uh, legally over the, uh, uh, over the lower class. And so uh, I think Peter was saying there, pastors, uh, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't prefer one or over the other. Uh, I like, many of you will remember the uh, lady, uh, she passed away years ago, Irma Bombeck. Uh, she had newspaper columns and, and things of this nature. Somebody once asked her uh, of her seven children, which one was her favorite? And she said, the one that needs me the most in a given moment. And, and I believe that that ought to be the pastor's approach as to who his 
uh, most valuable member is. His most valuable member or his most important member is that member that needs him the most uh, in that given moment, who needs that spiritual direction. Because the truth is, trials and suffering are going to come to Christians in every single church. And so as pastors, we are called upon to do our best to maneuver and to help our, our flock maneuver through those struggles and challenges. So, uh, which, which I've already covered part of this, so it means that we also need to have a loving concern for God's sheep. And some of those sheep from time to time go astray. And we need to have loving concern for those sheep and go after them. And so, uh, so that's, that's part of our responsibilities uh, in, in all of this. And then finally, uh, finally, church leaders must have a desire to please Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Um, there haven't been many. Over my 41 years as a pastor, there's not been many. But there have been a few times that I have felt like that I have dealt with the situation all by myself when others in the church should have been helping me with that given situation. And um, sometimes a leader is called upon to even stand uh, alone if necessary. Uh, it won't go into any details, but uh, uh, there was a time that I had a very large deacon board and, uh, and I was given some uh, direction uh, uh, about a problem and how to deal with that particular problem and I didn't feel that it was according to the Word of God. And so I had to figure out how can I be respectful to my elders and still uh, deal with the Word of God. And so I called for another meeting and we came back and, and uh, I got some uh, uh, counsel from other pastor friends who agreed with my insight on the matter, and um, and whenever we got back together and I'd had time to pray and study and think, I laid out the scriptures before them, and uh, and the majority drastically swung uh, in my in my direction in the direction that I thought that it should swing, and I really believe that at that particular time it was a turning point in that part of our ministry uh, at that particular church. So, so there are times that pastors have to stand up and, and, and we have to say, you, you know what, this is what God has laid on my heart and here's what the scripture says about this. And so we have to be willing to do that. Ties in with our memory verse uh, of a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So uh, that's Matthew 6, 33. And, and then also, too, uh, a verse that uh, ties in with a, uh, a song that my kids used to sing whenever they're uh, little. But whoever wants to be first must be the servant of all. And, uh, and anyway, I can remember especially, uh, well, Josh and Jennifer both, they used to sing a song, If You Want to Be Great, in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. And uh, the little cassette tape that would play in our car as we rode down the highway, whenever we would get to that song, it just had such a good feel. If they started singing, I started singing. I want to sing right along with them because there was so much truth in that passage of scripture. If we do want to be great, whether we are a shepherd or whether we are one of the sheep, if we want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. And if we do that, God's going to bless us. Thank you so much for participating in this Bible study with me. God bless you.